a committer on the Eclipse platform. Um, also a committer on another Eclipse project called the User Storage Service, USS, the SDK. Um, and I'm also working with a, a Google team on the, uh, their cloud tools for Eclipse. And um, I'm also an independent consultant who's done a lot of work with uh, various companies who've been adopting Eclipse. Um, but 15 years ago, I was a PhD student looking for a topic, and um, my supervisor said, you know, one of the best ways I've found to find a topic is to look at a problem that you've experienced and try to delve into it. I was really interested in software engineering and how it interacted with human-computer interaction and cognitive psychology, and I realized there was a problem that I experienced um, every now and then uh, where I'd become disoriented. I'd get lost when I was looking at the code. And so I decided to go and do a bit of a deep dive into that <coughs> and uh, ended up managing to get a thesis out of it. So one of the things that came out of that was a software tool called Ferret, which I'll explain today. I'll give you a little demo. Um, but I'm also going to dive into some of the reasons why, some of the theory about behind, uh, behind Ferret. Um, and I think it's actually broadly applicable to other software um, products because uh, I think if we did a poll, and I will do a poll, um, a lot of developers experience getting lost in, or becoming lost, but it also happens in other domains as well. Um, and some of the techniques that uh, we'll talk about are applicable elsewhere. Okay, so when one of the first things I did was uh, I started to conduct some user studies and interviews of uh, some developers who used Eclipse to find out did they ever become lost or not. And um, there was a question whether becoming lost, becoming disoriented, was a problem that was only experienced by novice developers. Maybe it was just newbies coming to something and they didn't know, really know what was going on. So I decided to go to the source and actually interview some of the original Eclipse committers who were using Eclipse on a day-to-day -day -day basis and who built the thing, and so they should be experts. And what I found was that a lot of them got lost too. Right? Sometimes you go into a method from a, into another method and I have no idea where I'm going, I get lost and I kind of get a lose track of where I am. Sometimes when I'm in browsing mode, I'll totally forget how I got to places. This person kind of said, you know, the, the tools in Eclipse are so good, you're right, I can F3, 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 go down deep, 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 and then I'll forget how I got there and why, what I was looking for. Right. Or, now I'm lost. What I tend to do is I go alt back, back of row. I'm lost, give me my context back, where am I? And after three or four things, if I'm not coming back on what I was expecting, I close everything. Right. And this is the way that a lot of people kind of deal with this problem. And so when I ask people, or when people ask me, oh, so what are, you, what are you talking about? I'd say, well, I'm talking about disorientation. Like, what's that? It's like, you know, haven't you ever been to the point where you've F3 down, you're lost, you don't remember why you were look there, what you were looking for? Everyone then goes, oh, yeah. So let me ask, who here has not been lost or disoriented? Yeah, see? Everyone's, it happens to us all. Okay. So what is disorientation? So in my, uh, in the papers I wrote, uh, I defined as being, when a developer loses the context or relevancy of their recent actions to their overall goal. Generally, we're goal-oriented. We're trying to accomplish something. We're looking to find the information that we need to make some kind of a change to a system, um, and that is our overall goal. But sometimes we get down so deep, we can't remember what we, why we were looking at something. So in other contexts, they talk about loss of context or getting lost. And what I found fascinating is that it's actually been reported in a lot of different areas. And they've done some deep introspection to try to figure out, well, why is this happening? So the World Wide Web, uh, probably about in the late 90s, there was a lot of discussion about how people got lost and why they got lost. And um, that was when information architecture became such a big deal. And how do you provide navigational cues to people on your web pages so they can go back to where they were previously or put themselves in the, in the context of the system? Um, we also see it a lot in real-world navigation. Yeah, a lot of institutional buildings, the, the hallways, the pathways all look identical. Right? People get lost in them very, uh, when, they're, when they're a newcomer to it, when they haven't figured out how things are laid out and haven't built that mental map. And there's a big amount of um, uh, area of research on wayfinding and signposting to help people um, navigate their way in, in real world buildings. There's also been a lot of work in control systems. I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, nuclear power plants, that was actually some of the first real academic uh, research that was looked into, um, and systematic research into, how uh, what they found was that nuclear power plant operators could get lost while they were using their control systems. It's not a great situation to be in, uh, so they wanted to look at it. Now what's interesting is that in these other situations, generally the structure that they're working in is very, it, it doesn't change that someone has imposed some kind of a system, and then it's just that people learn their way through it. What's different about software is the only software systems that don't change are software systems that are dead. Right? 
everything changes. We do these mass uh, refactorings where we rename methods, rename classes, separate things out to the point that you can come back to the same code that you wrote three months ago and you will not recognize it. You won't remember how things work, right? You won't recognize the key names. They kind of are in a jumble. So we actually have this problem where we oftentimes come back to our code and we are newbies again. And I think that's one of the things that makes uh, software di different. So nuclear power plants. Some of the early, earliest work I've found on disorientation was looking at why, soft, why nuclear power plant operators got lost in navigating their systems. It turned out that um, some of the systems were looking at trying to replace these paper-bound manuals uh, with um, online software systems. It kind of looked something like this. Um, if, if any of you guys are old enough, Gopher, uh, that was the precursor to the World Wide Web, it was a text-based uh, system. Um, apparently, the, the, what the, 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 the big idea was to take these huge wire-bound manuals and make them all online and relatively searchable. But what they didn't realize is that um, these paper books actually had a lot of uh, affordances that they gave to the users. They could put in bookmarks. They had found examples where people had like boot laces or shoelaces here. They had scribbled notes on them from uh, operators about encoding knowledge that they had learned, right? Go see page 353 if you see this red light blinking, uh, and that will tell you how to do it. Which all got lost when they moved to these electronic systems because the, the developers, or sorry, the operators were bound. They couldn't make changes. They couldn't insert bookmarks. They couldn't share that knowledge, at least not directly through the, through the system. So to the operators, it felt like they were looking at things through a keyhole. Right? Instead of being able to get a big picture, they could see a small um, channel at once. And what they found is that the operators were getting lost, which is not a great thing. So using um, uh, these guys were inspired by um, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, Hitchcock at the time was really relatively re revolutionary where he would um, well, I think I forgot that this can be clicked. Nope, nope. Uh, there we go. So Hitchcock was relatively revolutionary at the time because he would actually do a lot of long uh, long shots within his movies to set the scene so that by following where the camera was going instead of jumping from place to place, you had, could build this mental image about how things were related, how, how things were set up. And so in this case, this is a little frame from um, a movie Notorious where uh, Alicia here, she, it, there's a key moment where she shows that she has the key. Um, but he set this all up. So as you zoom in, you kind of know that we're up on the top of a staircase. You know that there's a big doorway here. There was a butler. Alicia has the key. Who she's facing. This is a big, big change at the time. Um, and it's uh, come forward um, and been adopted by everybody. So what the, the power plant, re, what the researchers who were looking at this um, were doing, were, they were trying to understand why is it that the existing system, the paperback, paper-bound books, why did this work and why didn't the, the displays, the new display system work? And what they, they drawing inspiration from cinema, they came with this concept of visual momentum. So visual momentum was a qualitative measure, so it's not something that could be easily uh, reduced to a quantitative measure. Um, but it was a measure of a user's ability to extract relevant information across multiple displays. And what they said is that if you have a system with high visual momentum, then the system helped them, helped guide them as they went along, so that they kind of knew where they were in context. Uh, when it, they were low visual momentum, then the displays were almost perceptually independent. And that meant the user had to carry a lot of this information in their heads instead. And they identified a few techniques for how to do this. So one of the things like long shots or overviews, what we saw in that uh, film, the use of landmarks, so they're well-known places that people can relate to, and how we organize things spatially uh, can also be very useful in helping uh, turn a display from being a low visual, from having low visual momentum to higher visual momentum. And maybe it comes as no surprise, but in Eclipse, we have a lot of low visual momentum displays, because when I go and do an F3, all my editors change, everything that's shown changes, um, there's really not that much binding context that I can draw upon to go back. So um, I was starting to look at this bug. I'm just going to do a quick demo here um, to do with uh, eGit. Oh, this is, I hope you guys can see this. So eGit has this, um, there's a, Git has this uh, concept of a credential uh, helper. So um, where you can hive off to an external program to go and get a username and a password to be passed up to, to a remote system. 
EGIT and JGIT don't have an implementation for this, and I was looking to see, well, how hard would it be to actually go about doing this? Now in Git, the term is credential uh, helper, so I thought, you know, an obvious first uh, starting point is to, you know, control shift T, I'll just look and see what credentials things I can find in Git. And there's a bunch of things, and because I ran this demo yesterday, I don't know how to actually clear out the history from this. Um, of course, I found this credential provider class, and that seemed like a good place to start. So I went and looked at credential provider. Um, okay, so it's an abstract class. I get a, uh, JDT has added a lot of useful things from when I did my piece, but one of the best ones are, uh, I can hit Control T or Command T in place, and I can see all of the existing subclasses of a class, right? This is great, so I haven't actually, I've got, this is a bit more of a higher visual momentum display, because I hadn't lost that original context from where I was going. But as soon as I click on one of these, right, I'm lucky I'll have a, an editor tab. That's the only thing that's really consistent between jumping between places. I have to remember, in my head, why it is that I was looking at this. There's nothing that helps me from the environment itself. Um, now maybe I want to go and see who creates this class, you know, so I use the wonderful control shift G, right? This is one of the things that was Eclipse's claim to fame well, way back when. Uh, we have a really powerful search tool, and it is great, but um, when I do a search, I get four things. I can go and dig through this, I can go and look at some of these and see, well, what's going on here? I can get to this install. Um, I have a bit of connecting context there in the search. That's pretty great. Okay, so let's say I'm, I'm gonna look at a few of these different credential providers, and I'm gonna go back to this original credential provider, because actually I saw that there is this thing, a, a default for provider, right? So I wanna see where did these, where, how is this default provider? Where is it obtained from? Is it widespread, or is it only in a certain place? So I do a control shift G, and you can see there's a big search going on here, and this reference count is Going up, it's 70, 81, 84. 84 references to this get default method. That's kind of astonishing. Um, but it's a bit weird. Oh, go away. It's a bit weird because I have references to this in org.eclipse.core.resources. That seems unlikely. Um, and then we have this little annotation here with potential match. Now, I, I don't know if there's any JDT users here or JDT developers here. But this is a really questionable decision I thought that came into JDT, where they have a, a preference to do approximate matches. Um, and one of the first things I do is I turn this off, ignore potential matches. So what it seems that it does is it will look for uh, similarly named methods or fields, and it will bring those up as well. I'm not sure how this is helpful. I would certainly, this is the first thing I turn off right away. If I do that and then do reissue my search, And I get defaults, and I get a far more reasonable number of, of searches or results. I get four. That's great. So if I go and start examining these different ones, um, so for example, there's an Eclipse uh, SSH session factory here, this credential provider. Okay, so it gets the default when we're doing that. There's another one in JGIT. So there's two transport things. So and that would seem to be fairly fundamental in JGIT. So JGIT kind of, if you don't know EGIT and JGIT, JGIT's kind of the implementation of Git. EGIT is the tooling for Eclipse. And for what I'm looking for, I'm gonna do everything within EGIT. So the JGIT stuff, it's great that I know that that's how it's obtained the default credential provider. So I somehow probably have to hook into this somewhere. Um, but hopefully I don't have to actually make those changes. So let's see, now I need to go back to my credential provider. So I have to remember where this was. Unfortunately, you know, the search provides a little bit of information there. Right, so I go back to credential provider, but it doesn't take, I don't have a way of taking me right directly here. So there's a set default. If I look at the set default, right, and this is the kind of thing that you have to do is if you were trying to implement this, trying to figure out, well, how is the default set? Uh, what do I need to do to make a change to a, to a, a credential provider? You know, I'll go and navigate down here. Um, there was one part, right, so there's this method here, set up credential provider. So this is somehow set on an activator, I'm gonna guess this is a bundle activator. It seems like an odd place to do it, but they set it to an eGit credentials provider. And maybe I'd look in here, and so this is a class that gets the credential provider for eGit. It tries to get the credentials. So this might be a place that either I have to replace or where I might try to insert my, my change. So I might look at this, I might need to go and examine some more, but eventually it gets, I get kind of buried, right? Like I'm presumably gonna be looking at multiple editors. I'm gonna have multiple editors open. 
And going back to where I originally started can be a bit problematic, especially since I'm new to this code. So this is what um, Ferret was kind of trying to address, was we spend a lot of time, okay. We spend a lot of time examining code, but the environment's not necessarily helping me as a newcomer to remember where I came from. So there's not a lot of visual context between files. Um, in some of the studies I, sh I was looking at people, they were having to scroll up and down in a file to try to continuously go being back and forth, so they were thrashing, which meant that information was not being shown. Um, this one's also a big thing, is that oftentimes we pursue these digressions. We go down little side paths. Oh, I wonder how this works. I wonder how that works. And when we go down these little side paths, it's sometimes hard to remember why, what we were doing originally. So when I t kind of stepped back and looked at why developers become disoriented, it's kind of like two main problems. One is that they had problems answering the questions they actually were looking to ask. They were having to, they had these high level questions they wanted to ask, and they were having to try to break them down to answer them in the tool, in the, using the searches that were available in the tool, and then correlate that information back. And I'll show you what that can, how that can become difficult. But the other part was they're having difficulties making sense of what they could see. So when, you're, when things are new and unfamiliar, the names kind of blur together, right? There's an EGET credentials provider, there's an AWT credential provider, there's another credential provider. How do they all, what do they, how do they differ? It's that stuff that I'm having to explore, but I may not remember those terms very well. And then we also get other problems where we're, we're mixing different sources of program information. None of us are writing just Java code, we're also writing uh, text files, we're also writing uh, this metadata, we're writing this uh, meta file here. Um, and we have questions about them. So like, for example, I was looking at some code just the other day where I was trying to figure out, well, who's talking about, who's bringing in Jackson? How would you go about trying to find what bundle provides Jackson? Because I'll give you a hint, it's not org.codehouse.jackson, it has a different name. Um, or what feature do I need to include when I'm trying to package my stuff together? Are you trying to break these, trying to answer these questions require going down, breaking your question into multiple steps. Um, I usually ended up uh, going to using grep to go and try to grep through all the featured XML files to find the right XML file that had the bundle that I was looking for. But that's multiple steps that's taken me out. Um, and this is one of the uh, first editions I put into Ferret more recently. Or what feature includes this bundle? What do I need to do to bring in JFace? Okay, so Ferret is a tool that um, tries to help. All right, so let me just give you a little bit of an example in Ferret. So Ferret is designed to look kind of like the search view. I can click on things, I can query with Ferret, and it pops up a little view where it answers a whole pile of questions. So Ferret's kind of like Java search or search on steroids is how I like to describe it. So it turns the question answering around a bit from being uh, what do I need to do to answer this question to I'll go and answer all the possible questions I know about. You spend your time looking at the results. So there's a bit of there's hope that there's a, some serendipity of that will occur. Because sometimes you'll find, and I don't know if you guys can see this in the back, maybe I'll uh, drag this up here. Um, let's go back. I can go back to previous queries as well. But there's lots of answers, and I also get a, a sense of the number of responses that are here. So how many, how many answers are there to these questions? Ferret also lets you dig into things. So I can say, well, I want to see all the implementers of this abstract class. So here's all the, because it's an abstract class, I kind of consider anything that subclasses as being an implementer. Here are all the classes that implement it. And then I can also ask further questions based on these. So you can drill down very quickly into, um, to ask interesting questions, but you still have that chain back to where you started from, from that credentials provider. So right, siblings is not oftentimes that interesting, but instantiators, who instantiates this class, that can be. And some of the interesting things is that there's actually some, some of these questions make sense from interfaces, interfaces as well. Who implements this interface, or who implements, or who instantiates this interface? Who instantiates instances of this abstract class? Right, it lets me reason about the system in a broader sense. I don't have to go break it down to looking at the individual implementers of this class find all of those and examine them and then try to uh, correlate them. Now, um, one of the things I find handy is that there's also the ability to cluster, to slice and dice the responses. 
So I can cluster the results by different attributes of the answer to that result. So I can try to cluster it by the client package or the project. I can also do things such as uh, whether it, if, if you're using the Eclipse uh, naming conventions with internal classes versus API or dot, dot provisional, you can also break it down that way. So that way I can say, you know what, I'm only interested in implementers that actually are API versus internal classes. Um, another thing that's useful to be able to do is, uh, and you can do this in, in JDT search, you can also remove irrelevant things. So once you've done some slicing dicing, it's like, I don't care about internal classes, I'm just gonna hit delete, and now I can go back to my original response and do some further things. Now, Ferret also allows you to go and do, um, to kind of bridge different uh, boundaries. So we use, a, in, if you're developing an Eclipse plugin, you're using PDE, you're creating OSGI manifests, you're creating plugin.xml files. Um, sometimes uh, we need to be able to reference between those, and of course this isn't a great example. Oh, right here, so up in this part here, I can say for this class, wh which bundle is this, defines this class, right? So I can actually see, well this is in JGit, uh, what other packages does JGit export? What packages does it import? Um, what features package in include this bundle? Or which features require this? So it's not a hard dependency. That's like PD terms for whether it's a hard, a hard dependency or just something, uh, a soft dependency that it wants to have come in. Um, these things are great. Like when I was trying to figure out how, how to package up other software, I was using these queries all the time. Because the only al alternative I found to this was actually using grep or, because I couldn't use Eclipse's search because the file search only looks for your projects, whereas a lot of these things were being pulled in from bundles from your target platform. Okay, so I hope I've given you a flavor for what Ferret's like. Ferret's generally pretty fast. Um, it uses JDT search and PD search under the hood, um, which are scale really well. So this scales to, you know, like I have regularly have uh, the entire platform in my workspace, and I'm using Ferret very happily. Where it doesn't scale, or where it hits problems, is if I accidentally hit java.lang.string or java.lang.set, because those things are used hugely everywhere, right? And ferret is a good little, little animal. It will go and dig through and try to find all the, all the answers. And uh, when that happens, the easiest thing to do, because you're generally not interested in that, is to just close ferret and then reopen ferret, and it will start over from scratch. Okay, so I talked a little bit about um, why developers become disoriented. I'm going to dig in just a little bit into uh, some theory because I think I've got five minutes and then questions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. So the problem with what, what that ferret addresses, really it's, the, the, why do people become dis disoriented? It's kind of two parts. One is the in synthesizing the information that you can see, that you've seen into a coherent hole in your head. But there's also a problem with trying to f ask the right questions that, an that answer your questions that you really want to answer, how you break those down into things that can be answered. Um, Herbert Simon is one of the, the granddaddies of cognitive psychology. This great quote, information is not a scarce resource, and this was written, I think, in the 70s. It's only, it's only worse now. Attention is the, hard, is, the, is the scarce resource, right? And that's true for developers as well. We can only pick up so much. There's a lot of information that's available, and trying to figure out what's relevant is the really hard question. So, one of the uh, theories that I found really inf uh, influential was uh, George Miller. He had coined this uh, Miller's Law in the, uh, some studies that he did in the, in the 50s, where he would give people random strings of numbers and try to see how many of these, uh, how, how long the string can people remember. And um, what he found empirically was that people could range from five to up to nine. Um, some people can memorize far more than nine but it's because they put a structure in these numbers. So these, two, these strings of numbers look kind of weird for most of us, but if I told you that, actually, that's my business phone number, right? In North America, people are used to this kind of numbering style, and they will put the numbers in, into this kind of a, uh, a containment structure, and then it becomes much easier to remember. Or this other number here, I think that's the OBO phone number. Right. So someone in France is much more used to be able to remembering pairs of numbers. I still find it hard, um, not being a, a French person. But when you have this kind of structure, 
then you can try to spot it. You cr you're creating a, a pattern around it. You're, you're chunking that information around. Um, and it turns out that this law of this seven plus or minus two is actually, it's not just individual numbers, it's actually, you can remember seven plus or minus two chunks. And as we build chunks, that a chunk is kind of like information that we think of as a related whole, then we can remember more and more things. So one of the problems that newcomers have when they come to code, and I use the word newcomer instead of newbie because we are all newcomers at some point, is trying to remember or trying to figure out how this code relates, what are the pieces, what are the chunks. And as I can build a better understanding of that system, they're becoming bigger, part of a whole chunk or, or several chunks, and I can remember more. So one of our goals really when we build software tools, exploration tools like Ferret, is to help people do this chunking as much as possible. So then how do we, what is, how do we help them with the, that chunking process? Well, part of it is that you're trying to make it easy for people to, to ask the questions they want to ask and find answers to them. And there's kind of a mismatch between the questions that they can ask, what I call concrete queries, right? So control shift G in JDT search, find all references to this, right? But it doesn't provide that more finer grain, like if I do control shift G on, a, on, a, on a, an exception type, I might be interested in not just references to that type, I might be interested in find me all the places where this exception is thrown, or where it's caught, or where it could be caught, or where it uh, actually has been listed as being caught. Or find me all the methods where that are marked as being as throwing this method. Right? These are all different sub like, ways of slicing that, that one question. But with a control shift G, I have to spend time breaking down and then examining all the pieces and filtering out the ones the, the parts that are necessary. So the question that I want to ask, we call the conceptual queries, are different from the concrete queries. And what happens is that if there's a mismatch here, then I have to take my conceptual queries figure out how to answer them using concrete queries, and then manage the work to actually answer my original question. And if I have, there are, there are um, three different uh, kind of steps in doing this. So one is there's a mapping and scoping problem. So if I'm gonna ask this question, like where is this exception thrown, right? So I've got this class, I do a control shift G, I find a whole pile of references. I'm gonna find classes that subclass it, I'm gonna find methods that may throw it, I may find methods that are marked as throwing it. And so I have to look at these and say, you know what? Those classes aren't useful. This method, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, these ones, look, they're actually throwing an instance of this method. Those are the ones I want to look for. So I've had to go and do a lot of filtering, winnowing. Sometimes, though, I need to actually say, I have to go and do multiple queries and then somehow collate them or correlate them. So if I'm looking for uh, who instantiates this, inter this interface? It actually turns out to be a really interesting question. I use this quite a lot. Um, it's just I could never really do this before, but Ferret makes this possible. So I have to go and say, well, first I will find all the implementers of this interface. I'll then find all the instantiators of those classes, and then, but I can't do this at the same time. So I have to do it all for this one, then all for this one, examine them. And while I'm looking at these ones, because I'm presumably looking trying to understand something, I've got to remember what I learned from these ones, because those ones are now probably off the screen. And then the third kind of problem that people hit are where you're having to integrate across different tools. Um, so this, in, in the original version of Ferret, I actually was leveraging TPTP, which is a, unfortunately a now defunct Eclipse project for doing profiling. One of the nice things that, is that it would record a trace, and then I could mine that trace and use that to actually look at the real behavior of a system. So what I wanted to be able to do was say, well, I've got this interface, it's widely implemented, but I'm actually, I only care about what sent the actual methods, the implementations of this during a trace. This actually turns out to be really, uh, really interesting when you're using something like Argo UML. Argo UML is like, uses reflection on reflection. It, it's terrible, it's hard to understand until you actually look at its real uh, runtime behavior. Um, so in that case, what I'd have to do is try to say, all right, I'm interested in these particular classes, I'll look for the, these class methods, and then I'll go and try to dig down and uh, figure out which of these versions were actually sent from this, this dynamic trace. With Ferret, I can actually kind of overlay this information, so I can actually show you what methods were actually sent when you're, when you're clicking on this. So I'm kind of using these different tool sets to eliminate uh, my having to look at information. Unfortunately, I don't have an implementation since the TPTP is gone, I was actually just thinking maybe Echolemma, I might be able to use 
their traces to, to integrate this. And being able to integrate all this information from different tool sets actually turns out to be really useful. So um, Ferret reacts to selections, the things that you select in the UI, and we have a lot of different views that reflect different um, model objects. And so there's things like in PDE, these are all classes that we're really not aware of, but they're reflected in the, uh, whether you're using the manifest editor or whether you're using um, like the target platform or uh, they're, they're just various views that show up. And these are the, the model ob objects they have. And they have correspondences to other objects elsewhere. Um, and so for example, um, we can map things like a project to being to a plugin, which may be a Java uh, project as well. And um, Ferret has this, it's like the adapter manager, the adapter framework, if you're familiar with that. I have an equivalent that's kind of on steroids because one of the things I realized when I was doing this is that not all of these equivalences are perfect. Sometimes they're almost right, they're kind of equivalent. Sometimes they're a bit inexact, but it's actually still useful to be able to establish correspondence between them and be able to reason from them. So to make this a bit more concrete, um, and I've just lost track, right. So when you're looking at the, when you're using the debugger, and you've got uh, like the variables view, or you're looking at the stack trace, these objects are represented as like stack frames or field variables. Well, they, we know, we would think of them as being the same as like a, job, like a JDT field or a JDT uh, type. This correspondence framework lets me say, well, take the stack frame and, or, or to a method and I'll just treat it like it's the equivalent method and then issue any queries from that point. I don't have to try to figure out, well, how, oh right, that was this method. I'll navigate, find that method and then invoke. Uh, ferret from there. So it really reduces the number of steps I have to perform. Um, and it was surprising. We even have some places where we actually use java.lang.reflect and we reflect those classes into our UIs, um, which I thought was pretty cool. So if someone doesn't have something like Ferret, then what do they have to do? Well, they do what most people do. We try to reformulate our query, say, say all right, well, uh, I'll use Control Shift G and then I'll go and winnow things out. Sometimes they'll go down this path long enough, and they'll say, you know what, this isn't working. I, there must be a, a different way I'll find that information. I'll use grep, or I'll use this, or uh, some other thing. Or sometimes they just say, you know, I've got to bite the bullet, this is what I've got to do. And they'll go and do the search, and they'll manage it, and maybe they'll write things down, so they'll try to uh, externalize things. But really, the, the problem here is that all this effort takes them away from the original question, which is, you know, trying to figure out how do things work, how do I get my work done, um, and increases the chance that they may get lost. Okay, so I hope I've motivated Ferret. I hope you'll go and give it a try. It's up, I'll, I'll give some links in a second. Um, just in the last couple of minutes I've got here, there are a lot of things you can do for remaining oriented. One of the things is try to avoid using F3. Um, control Shift T, right, showing uh, type information, the type, uh, hierarchy in, in, in a little pop-up um, is great. Control O for doing outline and Control F3. Control F3, most people don't know. If you do Control F3, uh, over top of like a method or a, a class, it kind of does the equivalent of control O, but in place for that method. So you don't have to jump to another file to look at its contents. Um, and one I only realized, came across recently, is if you hold shift as you hover over a method, you'll actually get the uh, uh, little pop-up with the source code. So you don't actually have to go and switch to look at the source. Um, the color hierarchy view actually is very similar to ferret, though it's only about uh, color hierarchy, about method references, but it still lets you go and go down, 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 um, and still see where you came from. Another tip that I noticed a lot of the Eclipse committers way back when uh, did is they would also close their editors. So there was one guy who was very systematic as he was going through, this editor isn't being used, he, uh, he's finished with it, he closes it. That way he's got a working set that actually reflects what he's kind of thinking right now. Um, I take that actually a different level, to a different level. I actually use lots of different windows. And this is something that's really unusual, it seems, with Eclipse developers. A lot of people just have one big window and do everything in that window, which is actually kind of terrible. Um, so if you do window, new window, you will pop up a new window. Or if you hit F4, there's a setting for, uh, for that will show a type hierarchy or a hierarchy view. You can actually have the hierarchy be opened up in a new perspective. And there's also a setting to say, open new perspectives in a new window. And that's what I run with. And so it's great. So if I'm looking to do some exploration, I hit F4, I get into new window, and then I use ferret within that window. Once I've answered my question, I close that window. My original window where I started this inquiry, I can, I'm back at my original context. 
right? That's all preserved there, and it's, it, it makes it really easy to, uh, uh, to, to, to get started again, to get back. Then the last thing, one of the other developers who said he never gets lost uh, when I did these interviews and studies, and it's true, he did never seem to get lost, he took copious notes. So he would write things down, uh, and he would then throw it away. And there's an interesting cognitive psychology um, area research around distributed cognition, where they look at how people work together, and one of the ways they work together effectively is they externalize things, so that people have common representations that they can see, and we think about things using what we see in our environment. And it's true of developers as well. It also helps with building that understanding as well. So a lot of this work happened thanks to these people. Um, if any of you guys ever think about doing graduate work, IBM, uh, getting IBM funding is fantastic because they have this Center for Advanced Studies. It gives you permission to go into anything to IBM. So there was, everything was open. Like even people who were saying, oh, this is confidential. It's like, you'd wave this little sheet and they had to let you go and watch. It was, it was fantastic. It was a really good way of uh, getting, getting some of the work done. Um, Ferret is up on the Eclipse Marketplace. So if you just look for Ferret, or uh, I've got the source up on GitHub and it has a link to that marketplace uh, entry as well. So I hope I've motivated why Ferret's interesting. I hope you'll go and give it a try. Um, the code is a little bit broke because it was written when I was trying to get my degree done and uh, I had to go and implement certain ideas. So I'm now in the process of rototilling the code and making it better with 15 years of experience. Um, but I use it every day uh, and I actually, put this talk together because I gave a demo at a demo camp. We, were, we had some extra time. I'd already done the presentation that I was going to do. I said, actually, I should show you guys this tool called Ferret. And people were just wow. They're like, this is amazing. Like, you should go and do more about this. So I thought this is one way of trying to get it open. OK, well, thank you very much. Um, please remember to also re rate and review uh, your talks. As a PC member, uh, this stuff is important. We actually look at it a lot, for, especially for people who are coming back uh, for another time. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, this is one of the most common questions is uh, what is the relationship between two types? Between two, two classes or have, right. if I focus on one type. That's right. So and it's in a way it's it's like it's like putting a good Google Maps in your code. It's like how do I get from here to here? Yeah. And you can have different transportation yep. routes, different yep. ways of getting there. And for example, you might want to know, do I have my, uh, uh, can I transform a type into another via uh, an adapter? Can I use right. a task because it's actually the same, it's a subtype of the other one? Right. Would it be possible, uh, my first question, is there any tool, existing tool, that <coughs> exists? And if not, would you consider having these two first, because it would be invaluable? So it's a, that's a great question. So I actually started down that path originally. I thought the same thing, like this would be really useful. So actually in Ferret there is some support. You can select multiple types and it will answer questions about those types. But there was a question and I, it was a, a tough question, a tough nut to crack and I had enough to do. But there are certain of those kind of questions that make sense for, consider these as an aggregate. So consider these as the equivalent and answer it for all three of them or all, all n of them. And there's some which are only answer these questions about these two things. And what I, I started go, going down this route because I was looking at visualizations and it would seem to be a natural thing to be able to say, well, throw this type here, throw this type here, show all the relationships. Um, and I started down that route, but it, the problem became too big because now you were trying to evaluate the difference between the representation and are these questions useful? And you get this, um, I don't remember, the, the, there's a Johnson's paradox, I think, where it, sometimes people say that, oh, the visualization was enormously helpful, but it's just because it was something new that, uh, they, uh, yeah, I don't remember the paradox name. It's not, I think it's Johnson's, but so it, was, it was hard to tease apart. So I didn't really go down that route. Now, one of the things, I actually have this thing called Type Explorer, which is also up on, on GitHub, which is, it uses Zest, which is a really simple visualization framework. It looks like JFace, uh, but it's for doing diagrams. It's really trivial to go and actually write a tool like this, where you say, you know, stick this here, stick this here, show all the relationships. It's really trivial, well, I wouldn't say it's trivial, but it's, it's very easy to do these kind of things. Um, and it's something that I haven't looked at doing yet, but. Yeah. Uh, I think so.
Well, I don't think I would add it to ferret, but I might add, might build something that so that, that works on top of the ferret questions. I think maybe that's a, a way of, of trying to go about it. Yeah, sometimes I, I. You search for both sites yeah. and you yeah. search for correlation yeah. between the sites. Yeah. No, it's something to try. Uh, I, I'll be able to try grabbing some time and do it. Yep. And another tool that helps you focus is minding. Right, right. That's right. Uh, actually, I was going to mention, I should have mentioned Mylan. Mylan is Mylan's really interesting in that uh, it does help, uh, it records your event history, and as you go along, things that you come back to, it then surfaces abo uh, above so you can remember it. Um, and uh, I've always meant to go and try Mylan more. I've never found that, that I've never found it worked well for me. Um, there's a lot of people who it works really well for. Um, I think that I, for the people where it works, I think it's a great, great thing. I end up writing, writing things down. That's how I kind of remember things. Um, I would, yeah. How did this like improving typing? Because I found myself always lost because it always types the most important thing I would like to see, and uh, and my 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 uh, people in my lab they type my so they they also get my my and they find the weird. No, it doesn't make sense. It's, uh, it sucks more than uh, uh, at least an hour. You know, <laughs> the other thing that I use that actually negates Mylan is um, I use the, uh, I never use this default Java view. I always use the, uh, the Java browser view. And it may be because I'm a, originally a small talker. But I think this is a very underappreciated view, uh, perspective, where it lays out things along the top. So it's like a class browser. So you get the projects, packages, types, and the methods. Um, I find that's much more helpful for keeping on top. Okay, well, thanks very much, guys. Well, thanks, guys. Uh,